<coughs> Good day to you. So this is the session for our VFC Council of Experts on the valuation or pricing of the hotel, the distress uh, as a distress properties during this COVID-19 period. And it may be still uh, going on for some times. So we have an honor to have our uh, participants and also our speakers here. So far, as I heard from uh, Madam Alexander, uh, Alexandra, uh, that we have around uh, 230 participants at this moment. So there are so many of us here. Thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, this uh, uh, event. And I hope uh, it will be very really, uh, beneficial for all of us uh, who are, uh, uh, who like to learn about how to price or value hotel uh, in this period. So let me uh, uh, inform you about the program today. The program today, uh, uh, is that uh, after my introduction, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Elvin Fernandez, uh, our former chairman of the International Valuation Standard Committee, uh, to speak first because he is uh, uh, in the sick leave, but he is very kind and really generous uh, to help speak. So he will go for some 10 minutes. And afterwards, uh, it will be my uh, presentation. And then it will be the presentation uh, of Mr. Uh, Scott Bitton, uh, who is the managing director of uh, Cushman, uh, senior managing director of Cushman uh, uh, Wakefield uh, from Seattle. So uh, uh, first, let me uh, introduce uh, Mr. Elvin Fernandez, the former chairman of the International Valuation Standard Committee. And uh, he is my uh, great friend. I visited uh, his uh, big office in Kuala Lumpur as well. And uh, he is now the managing director of the uh, Krong Jaffa group of company who do a lot of valuation. And he himself is a uh, leading uh, valuers in um, uh, Malaysia and also worldwide. So it is an honor uh, for me to uh, have him to be our uh, first speaker for today. Uh, Mr. Evin uh, Fernandez, the floor is your please. Uh, good evening uh, to, to all. Uh, my name is Elvin Fernandez. I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, I've been asked to speak. Uh, unfortunately, today I'm on, on sick leave, but nevertheless, I can spare a little bit of time. And I'm sitting in my house, not in the office. Uh, my office uh, executive assistant will be helping me with two slides on how to value uh, office, uh, uh, a hotel property. Uh, and this is an example, a typical example of a property before the COVID. And this is how I would do the valuation. Of course, when you do a valuation, the usual request by um, my clients is to do a market value. In other words, what is the market saying about the value of a four-star hotel in Kuala Lumpur? So I'm going back to March, 2020, and I've taken a typical uh, hotel uh, in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, of course, when you do this valuation, you have to know about the hotel industry. You have to know the numbers. You have to be familiar with all these things. One cannot just rely on a model and say, okay, the model says like this and the value is like that. One has to be, uh, you have to use judgment, you have to have experience uh, in doing these, and you must be quite familiar with those numbers. So assuming you got all that, 
and assuming you create a certain model, like the one I've created here, the only thing about, about this model is that I've truncated it. I mean, I've got year one and year two and year three and year six, and then year nine, and then year 10, and 11 and thereafter. I've truncated it so that it fits into the screen. So this is how, we, this is the kind of model that my company would use to analyze market transactions and then subsequently value a hotel. So we are, in other words, we are finding out what is the market value based on actual market transactions in the past. And one of the important things in Malaysia is that our regulatory framework is quite good insofar as valuation is concerned. We have an act of parliament and an act of parliament, which is the law, it says that you must be a registered valuer and then only you can practice valuation in Malaysia. And under that law, you have what is known as the Malaysian valuation standards as well. And the Malaysian valuation standards, one of the overarching principle in the Malaysian valuation standards for the determination of market value is that all the inputs must be market derived. That is very logical because how can you get market value if you don't use all the inputs that are market derived? So this market value or sometimes in, in, in accounting is referred to also as fair value is arrived at by taking market derived inputs. So it cannot be challenged. You're arriving at market value from market derived inputs. But of course, if you, if you create a model and then you tweak the model for each different assignment, that won't, be, that won't give you a correct answer. But if you use a model that you create and you consistently analyze it, analyze past transactions, and you use that same model to derive the value at another day, then you are getting market value. You're getting it from the market. As you analyze, so you value. So here is the, here is the, 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 uh, the picture uh, from that model. You can use, as we all know, you can use a comparison approach to value, in which case you have, you take the value that was determined in the market some time ago, and you can divide it, for example, the number of rooms, and you can say the market value for four star hotels in Kuala Lumpur is 800,000 per room. But how do you adjust for the dissimilarities between one hotel and another. There are obviously not all hotels are the same. Each of them will have different attributes. So therefore the comparison approach, yes, it is useful. Yes, we do use that. Yes, we do it to go and and get an overall figure, but it, there may be a range in which uh, the, the market transactions of the past may point to, and then you got to select your actual figure. But then the other approach is the income approach. And in the income approach, a discounted cash flow, such as the one you see on the screen, is what many valuers construct. And in constructing that, some of the key variables they will look at is the number of rooms, the, the occupancy rates, 
the room, uh, the average room rates, the various costs uh, in the hotel. Of course, in the, in the hotel industry, many of these costings are quite well known and they do not differ that much one from the other. But of course, for various reasons, they may. But generally, if you are a valuer who has been working and doing valuations, you will be quite familiar with these numbers. But if you're not an, a, an experienced valuer and you're doing it for the first time, uh, it will be quite confusing because you won't know whether that number that you put for any one of the costings or the average room rates or the average occupancies reflects the hotel that you're valuing. So obviously in doing this valuation, you have to be, you, you have to have done a lot of research, background research and got the numbers correct. But let us assume that I've done all those things and I've got the net income finally, which you can see orange color over the number of years. Like I uh, uh, don't forget, I've truncated it you know, you can't see year four, you can't see year five, you can't see year seven. I've truncated it in order to fit into the screen. And then comes the mark, the, the discount rate. So how do I get a discount rate? Now in business valuation, usually it is uh, uh, done on the basis of a weighted average cost of capital or capital asset pricing model and so on and business valuations look at uh, debt and equity combination and so on. But in real estate valuation, when you're doing market value, you are going for a pre-tax discount rate. Because market value, when I sell to you, and uh, if I put it into the market, I do not know the specific debt and equity structures of of people and I do not know the tax implications. So valuations for real estate is on the basis of a pre-tax uh, pre thinking. So what is my discount rate? Very simple. You get it from the market. You've got your analysis of one transaction, two transactions, three transactions, maybe 10 transactions in the past five years. And you have analyzed all of those things, analyzed all those transactions using the same model. And you use the same model, you analyze those transactions and then you value. So all my inputs and my discount rate are market derived. So how can I not arrive at market value? when all my, dis all my inputs and my discount rates are market derived. So this is the value before the COVID. This is the value before the COVID. And then this comes this unusual event known as this COVID, a global event. Not many of us are very happy with it. But, and then there's a big question. There is a question about travel. There's a question of whether these hotels can maintain their uh, earnings and so on. And different hotels have had different issues. Some have had to close down. But the ones that have been able to survive and this particular hotel has survived. But, the occupancy rates have, is not the same as before. And of course, the thing is, you do not know also for how long this will last, whether it's going to be just for one year or two years or three years and so on. But in this case, 
And what you're looking at the screen now is not the March 2020 valuation. It is a March 2021 valuation. And I have only to make it keep it simple. I have used the same cost cost that we used in the one year later, one year before, which was in March 2020. And I've only adjusted two things. I've adjusted for year one, year two, and year three occupancy rate. And I've adjusted for a slightly higher risk in the discount rate, because I don't really have a particular transaction which has taken place, a clear cut transaction. And one year later in the COVID, I'm adjusting for that slight higher risk. So instead of 12, it is now 12.5. And when I do that, and I'm not saying that's the only thing you have to do, you may have to do a few more adjustments here and there to show some increase or lowering of costs and so on. But for this example, I'm just sticking to three, uh, two, two items as changes between one year, which is March 2020 and 2021. Mr. And Fernandez, uh, two more minutes, please. And that's on the occupancy rate, thank you, and the discount rate. And you can see the final number changes. One year later in 2021, the value has dropped by 8%. Now this, is a good hotel in a good part of Kuala Lumpur, not in the town center, but slightly outside the city center. And the 8% is a reasonable value that the market, anyone will pay in the market for this hotel one year later and into, the, into this uh, COVID period. So there you have it. This is my simple explanation of how to value a hotel, a four-star hotel in Kuala Lumpur before, during the COVID, by referencing a valuation you, you have done just before the COVID. And uh, Dr. Sopon has just told me I got two minutes and I'm done, two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, you are so kind. Even if you are sick, you still join us. Uh, hopefully you will recover uh, pretty soon. But uh, basically you are a very strong man already, I, as I know, uh, because we know each other for over 30 years. Thank you very much. So then it will be my presentation, but let me uh, Again, thank our VFC headquarter, Madam Alexandra, Ms. Chia, and particularly uh, our section, uh, Mr. Narek, uh, who kindly helped organize this uh, very highly professional uh, webinar uh, for today. So uh, let me just uh, share my uh, screen a bit uh, about uh, uh, this uh, present presentation. So. Uh, today, I will do uh, this uh, presentation uh, on, uh, excuse me, make me kunba. One moment. Yes. Uh, first, uh, let me just uh, uh, inform you about the survey that we did in the past, uh, just uh, a few months ago uh, on the uh, valuation of on the uh, uh, pandemics and also uh, what happened. And this is around 59 countries over around 200 uh, something uh, cities. And we found that hotels, uh, the one at the Dow there is the one that will recover 
the latest uh, not uh, uh, not now it may be uh, one year or something more so this is the uh, situation of hotel but for authors will be a lot better so uh, hotel problem will be uh, really uh, bad hotel and resort properties and office buildings uh, as well as uh, shopping centers but uh, hotel will be the uh, last one that will recover according to the survey and this is the uh, recovering period for different countries and what about the uh, uh, changes in how prices in the past and uh, what we can see is that uh, there is no relationship between house price and uh, the pandemic or the uh, problem of the pandemic because uh, uh, even if there is a pandemic house price in many countries still increase substantially so there is no relationship but that is for residential properties but for income producing property like a hotel that is another story uh, so this is the between covid 19 and house price and uh, on the infected cases or all the dead cases that we did for the uh, for the regulation analysis and then the situation according to what we found is that it is uh, uh, terribly bad uh, this is from the statistics here and uh, this is in the case of Thailand hotels. Uh, this file I will give to you uh, soon. So I will just spend uh, my time a little bit. Uh, uh, and this is the case in Thailand that you can see that uh, the occupation rate is really low uh, these days uh, because of the uh, pandemic. So there is no income or there is income, but uh, not enough to service the uh, hotel or to service the uh, debt or something. And this is the international tourist. You can see that it is coming low, so very slow, even if it is going up in the near future, but still very low compared to the past. So this is our uh, problem in Thailand. And also uh, Thai inbound also very really slow as well. And the occupancy rate. So this is the estimate that, that may be around 30%, something similar to Kuala Lumpur, but uh, in the future, they will be going up. And this is in the case of um, uh, Malaysia, you can see that it is really low, something like in Thailand. In Malaysia, people cannot even travel interstate uh, because right now of the pandemic. And uh, this is the expert view. This man is uh, uh, another Malaysian, uh, but he is the director general of the Department of Valuation. He says something I cannot read to you, but uh, you can read it yourself. And also another professor here, and this guy from the Philippines, in the ASEAN Valuers Association. And Mr. Fernandez, you talked to him already. Uh, he already talked to us already. And this is another guy uh, from Switzerland. So he is uh, really uh, smart. So he has a lot of information as well. So you can uh, uh, read from what he said. He said around two, three years uh, to uh, be recovered in the future. But right now, the situation uh, still uh, not so good. And I just leave you to you this uh, valuation of, of, of this trace uh, hotels from HVH. Uh, so uh, this is a really famous uh, uh, paper you can download yourself in PDF uh, from Mr. Steve Rushmore. This is uh, like the uh, Bible for us. <laughs> and also another one uh, from uh, Kayuka. Something, this is something the step to buy this trace hotel, how to do this valuation. I also have the link for you to go on. In Thailand, we have the capitalization rate applicable for uh, warehouses, uh, shop, shopping centers, uh, office building, uh, service apartment, apartment, and hotel. But the thing is, for this particular year, 2021, we do not give you the uh, capitalization rate because there is uh, it is not applicable. Even if some hotel have income, but uh, they have no uh, uh, they cannot uh, they cannot uh, go on uh, so this is the problem in Thailand so uh, we don't give capitalization rate we work out capitalization rate for different properties but uh, for hotel for this year we cannot work it out so this is an, an exception for this year and also we also have the uh, cost of construction the cost of construction of our Thai appraisal and estate agent foundation uh, which is the uh, principal member of VFC in Thailand. Uh, 
we have uh, something like residential buildings, the high uh, the high quality one. It is around thirty one thousand baht per square meters. So maybe one thousand uh, dollar per square meters or one hundred dollar per square feet. So this is uh, the cost of construction in the case of uh, high price condominium, something similar to the hotel. But the hotel, we don't have this uh, cost of construction because hotel will be uh, different in the decoration, uh, in the finishing uh, architecture. So we have to appraise one by one. We do not give the uh, uh, cost of construction of the hotel, but just uh, 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 we may use uh, something similar to the residential buildings. Uh, so this is uh, just for the guide. So you we can you will be able to see this uh, in the website of our Thai appraisal and tested agent foundation. And uh, here I do not give you the uh, cash flow, but this is just some concept. You can see that uh, if uh, the year 2020, 2021, until 40 years, we expect that a hotel will run for 40 years. This is the economic life of it. We have some hotel who run for 44 years, uh, 43 years, and then they demolish because they can do something uh, far more better. So we uh, just uh, roughly give the economic life of 40 years. And you can say that normally the income may be around 100. Say, for example, uh, this is just a hypothesis. Say, uh, the net uh, operating income or the EBITDA, say maybe something about 100, uh, say maybe $100 or 100 million or something. But uh, if the uh, uh, NOI growth per year is around uh, 2%, and if the capitalization rate in normal period is 8%, you can see that uh, as a whole, uh, the value of the properties uh, will be uh, something. And But during this uh, pandemic, you can see that uh, during the past, um, during this pandemic period, uh, there will be no income. But some hotel has income. Some hotel may, be, uh, may adjust themselves to be hospital like hospital plus detail plus hotel so that they can still service for the patients, the green light patient. So in that case, they can still have some income that are some exception, but most of the hotel uh, cannot run anymore. Some of them close it. Some of them may run it, but with occupation rate of uh, 30%. In that case, the income just uh, only for uh, the expenses. Uh, they have no net operating income or really small, really small uh, uh, net operating income. In that case, we may assume that the first three years uh, may be no uh, income, but then year four, five, six, maybe they will recover. And then after recover, uh, they will be growing uh, with the uh, net uh, growth of around 2% per annum. And we, if we work out, uh, we said that uh, uh, if in the pandemic, the price of the hotel, we discount for uh, 29%. So this means that the, income, the value of the hotel affected by COVID-19 will discount for, will discount and the value will become 71% instead of 100% will become discount to 71%. Uh, discount is 29%. But if in the case that, in the case of cost sales, you need to sell it. In that case, we may further discount for another 15%, another one, five, 15%. In that case, the value of that hotel, if we have to sell today in order to uh, get rid of our uh, hotel, it will become only 60% of the normal price. The more normal price is 100, so this will become uh, discounted to uh, uh, 60%. And you can see on the uh, right two columns, you can see that uh, in this case, the if they have debt service, say every year during the first three years, they still have debt service for the cost of construction or something. This debt service will be minus, say minus 30 per year. In this case, you, what you can see is that the price will be discount from 71% down to 66%. And if we need to be in the condition of for sales, or if they have to sell it quickly, and they want to get rid of this property. So the price will be down to 56% or almost half of the normal price. 
So in this case, the buyers will be confident to buy. But if uh, no discount, the buyer won't be confident to buy. I may have another three minutes. Sorry, I have to run quickly. So this is the concept that we do. Uh, and another thing is that the cost of the in the cost approach, what we can see here is that uh, uh, we have to service the cost of construction during uh, the pandemic period. If we borrow money and to build the uh, building, uh, we also have to pay for the debt on this. And this is the problem of us. We maybe we have to have some negotiation with the banks or something. So this is the model for that. And the last thing is in the case of old hotel. In the case of old hotel, maybe there may be only 20 years uh, uh, left uh, to run. And afterwards, they have to get rid of it. In this case, uh, we may uh, realize the value for only the last the uh, last 20 years. And then afterwards, the land uh, belong to that will become uh, another uh, uh, amount of uh, amount of uh, capital because after the 20 years, the land, if the land not us, not belong to us, if the land belong to someone else, that is another story. But if the land is uh, belong to us, we run the hotel for 20 years or uh, in normal term, maybe 40 years. Afterwards, the land from year 41 to infinity is also considered the value. And what we find is that uh, in this case, we may uh, consider that the uh, land that we can occupy in the next 20 years, maybe around half price of the uh, market price of the land today. So uh, this is what we uh, uh, have to uh, consider. So uh, this is what yeah, my uh, presentation about. Uh, and you can go to the details later. Sorry, no need, no, no time to go into this further details, but this is the concept. When we run the cash flow, uh, we have to consider something else in details. Because right now, uh, as you can see in the case of uh, Mr. Erwin Fernandez, we can uh, work out the value of the hotel, uh, the four-star hotel or the five-star hotel. Uh, we can still work out because there are still many people to get in, in Phuket or some hotel in Kuala Lumpur, uh, not in Kuala Lumpur, outside Kuala Lumpur that I went to conduct valuation, they still uh, can be able to run the hotel. But uh, for normal hotel, for three-star hotels or for non, uh, uh, big, not, not a big chain hotel, uh, they are not in good shape. Thank you very much. So now uh, it is the time for me to let Mr. Scott uh, bitten to sorry if I uh, pronounce uh, incorrectly, maybe you can kindly introduce yourself later. He is an MAI, is which is the uh, really prestigious uh, designation uh, for the Appraisal Institute, and he is also a CIE uh, uh, counseling of the estate, counselor of the estate from National Association of Realtor, and also a member of IICS uh, like me, but he is a fellow of IICS. I'm the member of ICS, so he is uh, more advanced. So he is the senior managing director of Cushman Wakefield and Wakefield, and he just take over this uh, position recently. Congratulations for your new post, for your new work. So highly start, please. Thank you. Please, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sopon. And you're very gracious, higher than you, I don't think so. You've got a very stellar career. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and um, I will uh, turn on the um, turn on my presentation. So I'm Scott Beetham. I'm from the U.S. and I was um, <laughs> I have to admit I was joking with our, our our panelists. Actually, one of the one of the respondents is hi. I'm from British Columbia, and I thought somebody else along with Mr. Uh, Evan Bennett who's up, you know, our time right now is quite early in the morning, but I am absolutely thrilled to be here. And, you know, I, would, I was thinking because as I listened to Mr. Fernandez and Dr. Sopan, <clears throat> the, I, I, this is my second time with Cushman Wakefield very early in my career. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Kuala Lumpur to do a job. And I remember thinking as I landed and was working with um, um, a client that I was with and the team of folks from Cushman Wakefield that were on the ground and how different everything felt from where I came from. And I'm, I'm from Seattle in, in Washington state in the West coast of the US. 
And yet, as I got to know the colleagues, real estate principles are the same all around the world. And, you know, <clears throat> you know, this panel here, you know, there's a lot of really smart people and just, you know, globally things are different when you fly into a different location, but they're still the same in terms of how people look at real estate. And I listened to Dr. Sofon say, you know, just our, 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 our housing markets, really some of them went up, but hotels really were harmed. And same thing, you know, in the U.S., I think to myself, you know, our how, you know, not everywhere, but um, in most or not most, but many markets, housing prices continue through the pandemic. So I'm just going to talk about hotels here. And some of the things that I'll talk about have already been shared and presented, which is really good because then I'll just kind of focus on what is different um, <clears throat> and what, you know, how I look at how to value distressed hotels or hotels in the pandemic. Because in the beginning of the pandemic, I remember I was like, at first I was thinking, how do I value a hotel where cash flow is a fraction of what it was before? And there's no transactions. Buyers and sellers completely stop. No transactions. How do I look at the income, which is, you know, a fraction of what it, what it, what it was just six months prior? And then on top of it, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we knew how, starting to see how bad it was, we never, we had no idea when it would recover. So how do you, how do you put a value on an uncertain cash flow future with no transaction data? And so I started just talking to people, talking to buyers, talking to sellers, talking to market participants, talking to analysts. And what I started to think and where I started to land was, how am I going to look at that in light of the lack of information? But the information that's out there is the same information that the buyer and seller would have. And so Mr. Fernandez, when he was saying market inputs, the, the market inputs really became a little bit of transaction data that happened during the pandemic. But then talking to other folks that were having to do valuations, they were having to price assets that might be sold, price assets for their portfolios, and some consistent themes came out and people were look, all looking at much of the same data. So to start with, the... Um, the um, we all we saw Dr. Fernandez presented. It was really great because I didn't put a cash flow side into here. But you you all know, and you saw Dr. Fernandez when he went through the cash flow, and Dr. Uh, um, Mr. Fernandez and Dr. Sopon, same thing. So you know we do the same thing. We're going to do a ten year cash flow, and we're going to have a reversion, and we'll maybe do a direct cap as a check on the cash flow, and then we'll look at sales as a check on our cash flow. But but really understanding the um, the cash flow is how we really looked at it. And so, you know, you look down here and, you know, the real question for us and what I keep hearing analysts say and market participants say, and it's the next to the bottom bullet point, really, the question is, when will the hotel return to 2019 levels? When will we get back to where we were? And then you're hopefully back to the normal cash flow that increases at some reasonably and predictable rate, because market participants don't like the lack of predictability. And so that's really kind of how we started to think about, all right, <clears throat> I know what it was like in 2018 and 2019, you know, and, and you know, not all markets were going up and, or down, or let me phrase it, not all of them were going up uniformly, you know, and, and like across Asia Pacific, like across Europe, every market is really different. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the real question was, when do we get back to some, level of normalcy that would then we can have a reasonable cash flow after but like dr or like mr um, fernandez shared you know we did much the same thing we would model our cash flows down and then we'd model them back up again but using as much input from the market as we could even though there's not you know a lot of transparency with data or transaction data so you know i had a presentation about uh, three weeks ago and i shared this slide and it was just like in the United States, the occupancy declined more, the occupancy decline was even worse than the 1929 depression. Our occupancy decline in the US was the worst we'd ever seen. Um, and so you can see right here, this is um, CoStar and actually CoStar purchased uh, STR, Smith Travel. And you can obviously, you can see the decline in the um, occupancy and the average rate. I mean, those are canyons there. And so operating statistics were, again, were a fraction of where they were before, you know, 
this is this is the worst decline that we've ever experienced. <clears throat> At the peak of the uh, pandemic, there were 14 percent of the U.S. inventory of hotels that were closed, and you know, and and I had had you know I did appraisers of hotels that were closed that we knew would likely reopen, and so you have to look at that and say, when are they going to reopen, and how will that be? And again. The valuations that we were doing at the height of the pandemic, we didn't have any, even have clarity on a vaccine. So we didn't even know if or when there would be a vaccine. So a lot of uncertainty there. So some general kind of highlights that we kind of think about, you know, one of the things we did, and when Dr. Sopon referenced uh, uh, Stephen Rushmore, HVS um, put out some information or a study very early in the pandemic, and they really compared um, a couple of things. They, the, in particular, there was some data that was in um, Toronto after SARS, and, and it showed kind of the decline in the recovery. And then other, other analysts have gone out and shown a lot of information around uh, the GFC, the great financial crisis. So I, mean, I don't know why we call it that. 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009, when the, um, the economy just absolutely tanked. And then also the events, the unfortunate and tragic events of 9-11. But there's data out there that we can look at where we can see real large decreases in occupancy for various reasons, and then how long did it take to recover? And what we're seeing now is we're kind of getting more clarity. We're, you know, we at least know where there's vaccines and they're not, they're not uniformly, um, you know, distributed across the globe. And <clears throat> And, and actually not evenly distributed across the United States. There are large pockets of the US that, that vaccination rates are really, you know, they're not like they are in other parts of the United States. And so, you know, everything varies. And, you know, and, and now with the variants that are out there, those are, you know, that's, that's become a real um, monkey wrench or something that's kind of coming right at the very end. It's like, holy smokes, you know, we thought we had some predictable recovery, but now everything has changed because we're not certain exactly you know, how far will those variants carry into the um, pandemic recovery? But we have seen average daily room rate recovering faster than we had anticipated. And, you know, a lot of that is with leisure travel. We'll talk about the segments here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's one particular service that I follow, and, and I'll, I'll show a couple of slides here next. But <clears throat> the 80, <clears throat> some of the predictions around average daily room rate and when they recover. And the metric is when will it recover to 2019 levels? So average rate in whole dollars, when will that recover back to the, back to the levels of where they were in 2019? And when will EBITDA and when do we predict values will recover to back where they were compared to 2019? And when will occupancy recover back to where it was in 2019? And the theory is, is that that 10 year cash flow that we know is gonna be really disrupted in the first one or two or three years, but that at some point you hope that it gets again back to, you know, where it was in 2019 or, or what you would call stabilized, wherever you want to couch that or however you want to, you know, say that. And then you go forward with your, <clears throat> with your cash flow projections going forward after that. And so we're, we're just trying to model, much like you saw with, with Mr. Fernandez's slides there, we're trying to model how it goes down and how it goes back up. And even a closed hotel. So if we were analyzing a closed hotel, there are still fixed costs in, whole, in, in holding a hotel, even when it's closed. You've got taxes, you've got insurance, you've got you know, some staff that is on, still on site. You can't just have the, the building be completely vacant. So, so really those, that cash flow modeling it got real tricky. <clears throat> so the factors that we kind of think about is we try to say, all right, when do we think the recovery is, is gonna happen? What are the leading indicators? So we are now looking at air traffic statistics. Um, air traffic actually started to increase, you know, up to the 50 50% 50 mark of where it was before the pandemic. Um, and <clears throat> this past summer, air traffic did, did start to increase, but then with the variants, the air traffic actually has started to slow into the fall. And then one of the other things that we've noticed is that the um, um, commercial travelers still aren't back yet um, and we'll talk about that in a second when I talk about the segments. We look at booking volumes and, you know, we've got some statistics that we can look at in terms of, 
you know, average bookings and, and, and a lot of the booking volume is in a larger global, you know, across the US or maybe some certain segments, you know, some geographic segments, but at least we start to understand that there are increased bookings and, and, and that's been a very positive thing. And you know, this past summer was actually quite good for, for many of the markets. We still keep track of hotel closures. The hotels that have closed with the majority of them have opened back up again. There are a few that are, there are, a few that are still closed um, New York City in particular <clears throat> has experienced a lot of hotel closures, and some of those hotels will just never open up again. Um, and now what I'm going to talk about is just really the, uh, the various different demand segments. And so we kind of think of them in three buckets, the group demand segment, the business travelers, and the leisure group. Or sometimes it's called mice in other areas of, of, of the globe. But the, um, you know, there's actually been a lot of pent-up demand for group travel. And we're seeing that that's going to, you know, Q4 and into the next year, we're thinking that's going to be recovering a little bit more um, in, in more volume. You know, group travelers are still kind of holding off and some of the conventions and, and meetings that were scheduled for Q2 and Q3 2021 have been pushed into Q4 2021 or beyond. <clears throat> Business travelers, it's still a real question mark. We just really don't know, you know, exactly when they're <clears throat> going to come back. You know, again, each, each market is very, very different. If you look at um, a market that's got a lot of tech um, workers, those tech workers, by and large, across the U.S. are still not back in their offices. You know, so the travel is, is still not there. People are not going to offices. Financial services, professional services, you know, appraisers, accountants, brokers, bankers, you know, a lot of those, um, <clears throat> a lot of those users are back into the uh, back into the office, not uniformly. And not not in large large numbers, but they're they're growing. Leisure here's where the market for us gets real interesting. If you're a fly to market in the U.S., like Hawaii, or you know, in many fly to markets where you, you normally would get there by getting on an airplane, or even um, global travel into some of those locations, the um, <clears throat> those markets really got hit hard because people were just really resistant to traveling by airplane. If you were a drive-to leisure market, you had some of your best, like last summer, 2020, I was doing a study in, in more of a kind of a, a resort area. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and we've got mountain resorts and, you know, and beach resort, blah, blah, blah. But some of those, some of those hotels experienced the best summers that ever had. Because, you know, you think about it, you're home, you're with your kids, Everybody's working at home. Mom's working at home. Dad's working at home, or mom, maybe whoever's working and not working, and and uh, and the kids there are doing. You know, they've been doing school by Zoom for the you know previous number of months, and and you know, and we're we're quite lucky if, if you can work at home and you can do school at home, you're you're still lucky because you know everywhere in, in in the U.S. and the globe is different. But some of these tech workers, they've got a lot of cash, and by the time the summer rolled around, they wanted to go somewhere. And they would typically go somewhere that they could drive. They didn't have to get into an airplane, go through an airport and get an airplane. And, and those drive-to markets really, really did well. You know, in fact, when you think about where we're at in 2021, even, you know, the, um, the rev par increase, and, and we've got some numbers by market, you know, it, it's really amazing. It, it, the, the worst market for rev par, you know, is down 25.2% now compared July 21 compared to the previous year to date. The best market is up by 4%. The markets that did the, the best had leisure travel, a lot of drive to opportunities. The markets did the work were urban cities, convention cities, cities that had a high level of um, 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 corporate travel. You know, so, so every market is different. So it's not just one uniform thing across the US. So the um, so moving on, um, LARC Lodging Analytics Research and Consulting, um, they started a they started a research function a little bit before the pandemic, and they're really good. and um, And these are some slides that are available. You can get onto YouTube and you can see their presentations. Um, but why I like this is that this particular slide here is one of the one of the things they'll put out. They just came out with their September numbers, and I'm not going to say that these numbers are correct or absolutely right. Although when you, when you listen to their presentation and how they do the numbers, and there's a lot of great forecasting companies out there. I mean, CBRE does it, STR does it. I mean, these are all smart people and good forecasters. But this data 
and other data like it is what investors are looking at. Going back to market inputs, this is the data that I believe that market participants are, well, that I know market participants are looking at. And so we really kind of think about that. Now, this particular service will even, you know, come down to project where they think value changes are. And, you know, and they're, they're not doing evaluation. They're just predicting based on their models, the effect of the um, pandemic. And in this case, it's just U.S. They, they report in 44 markets, I think, but they're good. And, and the other services are good as well. Um, but this is just one that I, I, I happen to look at. And I like, I like, I like how they look at it and, uh, and whatnot. You know, and this is kind of the same information, but what this is, is this shares how they change by quarter. And, you know, the only constant in valuing real estate is change. Everything changes. And the pandemic, you know, it seemed like when we were in the midst of it and the, and the worst part of it, you know, I would wait for these numbers to come out by quarter, you know, because again, everybody is looking at it and trying to understand. And, and what I will say too is, is we didn't have much transaction data, but near the end of um, 2020, we started to see um, some transactions that occurred and, and they were all over the board in terms of how you would think they would have compared to the previous, um, you know, pre-pandemic. But in my home city of Seattle, there was one particular one, nice luxury hotel right in downtown Seattle, uh, went under contract, it had a hard time closing just because everything took longer. But the, the decline was about 30%, 30 plus or minus percent of where we would have thought it would have been um, had it sold in 2019 before the pandemic. You know, one of the things I'd always ask investors and people that I talked to and other, 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 you know, analysts that I thought were smart people and, you know, were doing the same thing that I did, that I'd ask, where do you see the declines? You know, you know how, how much decline are you projecting? Again, not to say that I want to do what other people are doing, but these are analysts and consultants and advisors that are talking to their clients who are thinking about whether or not they should sell a property or not. Um, the one in Seattle was not a distressed sale. It was order transaction. They had a number of assets. This particular group had a number of assets that they were shedding and they just needed to shed them for a variety of operating reasons because the hotels they were getting rid of didn't fit their full operating model. Kind of going back to what do I know about buyers and sellers? Because that's the only thing I can look to is the market. And if I don't have exact inputs, then I try to look for market sentiment. So I guess the last couple of slides here, and I'll, I'll be done here in just a moment. Um, urban and convention hotels really have been hit hard. Hotels that relied on corporate travel really have been hit hard. Fly to destinations I mentioned have really been hit hard. You know, global travel, you know, has, has essentially all but stopped. I mean, it's coming back now, <clears throat> but, you know, still it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, still global travel has not been a big effect here in our, our markets. Well, it's been an effect because it's not here. And then drive to destinations have been pretty good. And the other thing that budget and long-term stay lodging did actually better than a lot of the other segment types. And the reason why was because there was still a lot of essential travel happening. Um, a lot of hotels got used for um, COVID reasons, either, you know, patients that were, um, you know, or should say, essential service workers, so police, fire, medical, that, you know, maybe needed to quarantine. And so hotels, they had whole hotels that were just taken up by various entities and, and quarantined. And, um, and, and, you know, the other thing that I didn't put on the slide and that's been happening a lot is a lot of governmental entities are, um, are buying hotels for uh, those experiencing homelessness. So people who don't, you know, who, who are experiencing homelessness, and they're buying hotels because they're at some bargain prices, and they also recognize, you know, that the hotels are set up for large numbers of people. So it's been an interesting time to be an analyst and an appraiser and valuer in hotels. So I think with that, I'm going to say I want to say thank you to the organization and to all the other you know, panelists and then Dr. Sopan for being invited to this. Um, it's a real pleasure. I love talking about hotels, and you know, it's a real passion of mine. So. Um, I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing and then say, say thank you very much to everyone. And um, if you're at your end of your day on a Friday, I hope you have a good one. And, you know, if you're on the West Coast here, we'll get a couple more hours of sleep and then go to work for the day. So thank you very much. It was good to be here. Thank you very much. You are so kind. Now it is around uh, maybe uh, three o'clock in the morning or something in <coughs> your, your area in Seattle. 
Is it, it is. Yeah, wow, you are so sorry indeed. Next oh, time, no, if you uh, <laughs> do it better. <laughs> and and then, uh, our VFC USA also have a session at around uh, midday of uh, 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 Florida. I attend once when I was the speaker, when I was a speaker. But the last, I never attend because it is about midnight. I slept at around nine o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so uh, the thing is uh, uh, that thank you very much. Uh, you may know that uh, uh, two weeks ago, I went to stay in Chiratan, Chiratan Hotel, a very uh, famous hotel. And another week, I stay in Conrad Hotel. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the price is only $130. $130, that is half price. And they also give us a coupon, $80. So actually I pay uh, only uh, $50 for the, for the room and also enjoy the resort. Uh, and they can run the hotel and occupation rate maybe around uh, 20%, but at least they can keep their staff members to be there. So when they, they recover, they can uh, no need to recruit the new staff members. But right now, uh, actually, there may be uh, no income. So that is the problem. And uh, about the aircraft, uh, air traffic, as you said, uh, very important. This is a really great indicator. In Thailand, many airlines uh, bankrupt, or at least they have to sell the air, aircraft. And right now, uh, during the past two years, we value around uh, 10 or 12 aircraft already because uh, uh, there, is, there is no business and then they have to sell it. And even the, our broker class in our uh, uh, appraisal foundation here, even the pilot came to our uh, real estate broker class because they may <laughs> become a brokers in the future or something. So this is the problem right now. So now it is around uh, almost five o'clock already, uh, one minute to five o'clock. Uh, we have our panelists uh, here. Uh, uh, maybe we can listen to our uh, comments uh, from our panelists uh, uh, we are Mr. Edwin Fernandez still here. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Bitten uh, still here. And uh, I saw Mr. Ivan uh, Wilkoff. Uh, do you have any comments or any of us has any comment with uh, Bennett? Uh, and uh, Mr. Ivan, you, are you ready? Do, do you have any comments or any contributions? Huh? Or, oh, maybe someone, anyone else who, who uh, uh, like to comment, please. And uh, 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 by the way, let me congratulation to uh, Mr. Joshua Duncan. He just married and he is in his married marriage leave. Uh, congratulations uh, for your um, uh, marriage. So uh, any of us uh, uh, would like to say something, sir? Perhaps I could start if you allow me, Dr. Sopon, yeah. thank you. And I want to thank all the previous presenters, especially uh, Mr. Fernandez and Mr. Bitten for the wonderful uh, uh, presentations that actually get a lot of uh, framework of, uh, of what we are discussing. I, I would add a few comments from my side and few, uh, uh, few points of view that I think are, are worth uh, mentioning uh, while we're discussing the whole topic. I'm not a valuer, I must say. I'm a facility manager. And I used to, uh, uh, to run a, a consultancy company, uh, the local branch of Colliers down here. And we do uh, manage to keep a lot of uh, tight uh, um, relations with all the existing uh, valuation activities in those professional real estate service providers. So I managed to talk with a few of my colleagues about uh, today's topic. And I would try to actually give you the, the, the message of the active participants of the market, but not from my personal experience. What we're experiencing right here in our markets, by our, I mean Eastern European markets and mostly Central and uh, Southeast Europe, uh, the hotel industry has been severely hit by the current uh, uh, um, circumstances due to the pandemic. Uh, prior to the COVID-19, we were uh, uh, overseeing a steady growth in all the um, market uh, sectors in the hospitality uh, and hotel uh, industries and, and related services. Uh, 2019 was probably probably the highest ranked uh, uh, year in the transaction business of the hotel industry, in the activities, in, in the, um, the volumes that uh, hotel operators, hotel investors and 
hotel actually uh, users and consumers were, were, were experiencing. And everybody was hoping for the even better future in, uh, in the years to come. For example, in my own country, in Bulgaria, uh, we used to have uh, a hotel industry that uh, accumulated probably 12 to 13 percent of the GDP, which is a quite high number for a, for a, for a country uh, uh, like ours. And we were expecting in, in, in the next five years to actually increase that number to, to reach even uh, 18 to 19 percent. What we are having in the last 18 months, actually, is that due to the restrictions imposed by the uh, medical and governmental authorities, we, we've seen pretty much a complete shutdown for uh, quite some numbers uh, of, of, uh, of years in the, in the hotels industry. And that currently uh, is uh, due to continue for at least several more months. So that brings a halt to the whole activities in that sector, especially when they were based the, on the uh, negotiations and potential transactions for, for, for those uh, uh, assets. Pretty much when you have a government uh, preventing you for operate, uh, it's quite obvious that basically a lot of hotel operators and owners were, uh, were busy with not really getting their heads into their financial or operational uh, restructuring but uh, with the extensive and quite uh, active renegotiations with the authorities, how to uh, actually manage to get themselves through the crisis that were uh, imposed on them uh, and uh, uh, to see how they might recover. A lot of valuers that were busy with previous engagement on, in that sector, uh, quite uh, right now are not busy at all uh, delivering valuations on, on those assets. And they become pretty much, uh, uh, um, if I uh, can say, uh, uh, essential members of those work groups that uh, uh, could uh, support uh, um, some um, programs and, and ideas for, for, for recovery and, and resiliency in, in that regard. A few of my colleagues that, uh, uh, that, that engage with that uh, particular uh, sector are, are a part of multidisciplinary teams that are uh, working on potential highest and best used analysis of how those properties could eventually uh, be uh, uh, utilized during the next uh, 12 or 18 months and uh, switching them from purely hotel and leisure uh, uh, facilities to uh, facilities that you can have more um, other types of uh, specialized services. Uh, some uh, ideas reached even further that to uh, move them quite closer to the medical facilities that could have some people to recover after their potential uh, COVID-19 uh, implication for the, some sort of light uh, way of the, the, the they have been st stuck with. So uh, just to give you a few, few numbers uh, and to put some, uh, uh, some, some content on what's happening right now in, in, in our market, uh, in the most active Eastern European countries' capitals, we have a significant drop of probably 75% of transaction activities in the capitals. And we have pretty much a zero activity in those uh, resorts properties and, 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 and uh, uh, vacation uh, uh, projects. So uh, uh, that heavy uh, um, drawback uh, is uh, extremely uh, hard to, 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 to get along with in a lot of activities, as I mentioned, are focused on the uh, ideas how to, to get out of, uh, of that uh, current situation. And uh, our uh, focus and our activities as facility managers uh, in, in, in the market is to maintain the property in, in, a, in a shape that could allow uh, eventual easiness of those restrictions to, to uh, help the current owners and uh, users to, to get back in, in the normal conditions. And um, about the uh, uh, potential uh, activities on the distressed uh, uh, assets in general, uh, in the last uh, six months, there were no records of any, any uh, active uh, um, 
ideas of uh, potential uh, changes of ownership and, and uh, uh, active negotiations. So uh, we, would, we would hope to get uh, 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 as more as uh, possible uh, activities from the next few months eventually. And uh, I hope that some of the recovery in the general economy in general would help not only the local uh, hotel industry, but also the international transaction as we were expecting them to, to grow. Uh, one more number that I have in mind that uh, prior to the pandemic, we were expecting to have 1.5 billion euros of transaction to uh, in that industry that are currently put into uh, a standby mode. And uh, hopefully with the uh, potential recovery signs, we will be busy with those in the years to 2023, 2024, uh, as the optimistic scenarios uh, shows that we will head for that recovery uh, only within the next two years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very really much. Uh, one thing we uh, can see is that uh, in Europe, in Thailand and many countries in Asia, we expand the hotel industry a lot. And we can see oversupply in the market uh, in uh, 2019, prior to the pandemic. And we expect that there may be some problem in the near future, even if there is no pandemic. So this is a problem. And then when we have the pandemic come, so this means that many properties may need to be forced sales. So in that case, uh, they may not be able to sell it at the market price even. They may have to sell at the uh, forced sale value. So uh, there will be a a big loss for them as well, particularly when they borrow money from the banks or any other institution, they will be in big trouble uh, to uh, run the hotel or to own the hotel, uh, cannot own it anymore. Okay, thank you very much. So next uh, we have our, our one thing is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ivan Velkov is the president of FFC Bukalia. So now, uh, uh, Madam, yes. So, um, uh, who else? Uh, Madam Eva uh, Gonzalez, uh, uh, would you like to say something, Madam? Yes, of course. First of all, thanks uh, again for inviting uh, FIEPS Spain to take part in this very interesting seminar. And um, most of that, uh, thanks to the to the um, to the experts that have uh, told us a very very interesting points in this in this topic. Specifically in um, in Spain, I think uh, there is uh, we have to to remember what said uh, Conrad Hilton many many years ago. There is uh, three uh, things imp three important things. To, to remember when you want to invest in hotels. One is location, second is location, and the third one is location. You know? And I think it will be for, forever. But now even uh, we have another, another um, topics to, to take, uh, to take uh, in, um, on the table. Uh, it will be even important what the clients can do in the hotels. Uh, I remember what said the, the expert, Mr. Uh, Scott Bethan, about uh, the things that uh, will hurt it, but another, another aspect, uh, it, they're not as bad. For example, the hotels uh, where the people can drive to, or another uh, budget and long-term hotels. So uh, maybe we can we can think in alternative uses uh, of the hotel. What are the people are doing there? How many days are they spending there? Or maybe uh, another uses for the hotels, alternative uses as uh, hospitals or for um, senior senior people uh, being there, ad uh, adapting the buildings with not so. Uh, important investments. Investments we can change the the, the building a little bit to uh, have uh, the same or almost the same rentability as before. And the situation in Spain, we are recovering this summer. In Spain, we are around 
64, 68 percent occupation. It's not the same that as the the years before uh, COVID, for example, to, uh, to uh, 2018 or 2019, we are uh, we were about uh, 75 or 80 percent uh, occupied. So we are we are uh, far from that, but. Um, we are on the on the way little by little we are recovering in the hotels market but uh, we have to uh, think that not before 2023 or 24 it will be it will not be the same as before COVID I think uh, what we can see is that uh, for hotel uh, it is a good idea that uh, some of them right now they may become a hospital, hospital plus hotel. But if the list cannot really do anything further for hotel in the future, what we can do, as you said, is that uh, we may uh, do it as a uh, rental apartment in Thailand. We do uh, convert it to be a rental apartment instead of a hotel. This happened in the case of when we uh, when in the case that we uh, move the airport or existing airport to a new airport, hotels in the old airport uh, convert themselves to be apartment rental apartment. Some of them converted to be uh, service apartment with a hotel with a service. So that is something that uh, happened. And some of them even uh, convert to be something what we call in our region here, that is the condo tail. That is condo plus hotel. Uh, some of them may come and buy the units and uh, become the owners, and we have some uh, time share or something. So that happened uh, uh, in some case. But normally, uh, uh, if the hotel can run in the future, uh, we will try to uh, run it so that it will be uh, valuable as in the past. So this is the alternative use of hotel, and this this sort of alternative uses of the hotel also recommended by our uh, resource persons who uh, put in my paper that uh, some of them also recommend uh, something uh, for the use of the hotels. Okay, uh, uh, who, uh, anyone would like, uh, Mr. G. Evan Bennett, please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sopa. Yeah, it's a pleasure uh, to be taking part in this webinar. And I, you know, I especially want to thank Scott Beeson uh, Scott uh, and I actually, well, let me put it this way. Scott was my boss back when we were both appraisers at CBRE. It's been uh, a few years back, but uh, I really appreciate, you know, Scott, that you, uh, you're, you're participating in this webinar in the middle of the night. So thank you so much. Yes, and I uh, want to thank, thank Mr. Fernandez as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not currently employed as an appraiser. Currently, I'm uh, the managing partner of an investment firm. But of course, I still uh, use uh, uh, you know, appraisal principles on a daily basis. And I would agree completely with uh, you know, what's been said so far. A discounted cash flow analysis is far and away uh, you know, the most accurate way to approach this problem. You know, what is a distressed hotel worth? But I would like to offer a perhaps a more simple analysis because I'm not entirely sure, you know, what is the the knowledge level of the participants or the attendees who are viewing this webinar. I'm assuming that a lot of them understand how discounted cash flow analysis works, but uh, uh, well, just to offer a, 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 something about a little bit a more simpler analysis. So one of my primary focuses uh, in my work as an investor is value add office buildings. And quite often, uh, they're considered value add because they're not operating at stabilized occupancy. So th there's a similarity, something of a similarity between that situation and a hotel that simply isn't, uh, doesn't have any guests staying in its room. It's not getting revenue in that way. So if it's a, an office building that's not operating at stabilized occupancy, basically, I'm going to figure out what would the value of that building be or that property be if it was operating at stabilized occupancy? That's my starting point. Okay, it's not operating at stabilized occupancy. So how do I account for that? I come up with a lease up discount. How long is it gonna take that building to lease up to stabilized occupancy? 
let's say I estimate it's going to take two years. How much rent, rental income am I going to lose during that two-year period because it's not operating in a stabilized environment? Mark that number. How much uh, am I? How much expense am I going to carry? Paying taxes and insurance, you know, fixed costs over that two-year period. Mark that number. How much is it going to cost to lease it up? How much am I going to have to pay in commissions uh, or you know, to brokers to lease the space? How much am I going to have to pay uh, in concessions, maybe tenant improvements, or any free rent I might have to offer up to the tenants to induce them to lease the space? Mark those numbers down. So for just, just to give you a, an example of some of the, uh, the factors in the analysis. Now, just tally all those up. What's the total? Now, you don't stop there. You, you also want to take into consideration a risk factor. Okay, so I'm going to put forth the time and the effort to try and lease up this property, and I want to be compensated for that. You know, just to throw out a number, let's say, essentially, it's a profit. I want to earn a profit of 20% on the money that, that I'm going to be investing to lease up this property. So that's your lease up discount. Whatever that grand total is, you subtract that from what the market value of the property would be if it was operating and stabilized occupancy, and that is the market value. If you're looking to acquire that property, that's the most that you can pay for it. Now, apply that to hotels. It's not quite the same thing. Obviously, you know, you're, you know, compared to an office building, I mean, you're not going to have uh, TI allowances or free rent. Uh, you know, you're not going to be paying brokers to lease the space, but there are some similarities. You know, if you estimate it's going to take two years before the hotel is returned to stabilized occupancy, you're going to be losing all of that revenue that you would otherwise be collecting during that two-year period. And, you know, there may be some uh, capital. Income are the, uh, the fixed expenses like taxes and insurance. So you could, uh, in a certain regard, you could do sort of the same analysis. You know, you wouldn't call it a lease up discount per se, but calculate what the value of the hotel would be if it was operating at stabilized occupancy. And let's just say that that's what was happening in 2019. So that's your starting point. Figure out how, how much money essentially you're gonna have to invest over the next couple of years until it returns to stabilized occupancy deduct that number from what the value would have been at 2019, and there at least is an estimate of what the value is currently. Now, as I said, I offer that up as a somewhat more simple analysis than, a, than doing a discounted cash flow analysis. However, just to reiterate, I do agree a DCF is the way to go. So if I was going to acquire a hotel, and it was distressed. That's how I would approach it. I would do a DCF. However, as an investor, basically, the thing that's going to concern me most, what are my investors expecting in terms of an internal rate of return? If I said, for example, if I said 18% as a target IRR, and then I uh, assembled a group of investors, and they've provided me with the equity income uh, with the well, with the equity, I should say, uh, to purchase that property, they're going to be expecting a return of 18%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the DC, DCF analysis and, and factor in uh, you know finances. You know, so looking at my the cash on cash internal rate of return, and I'm going to come up with the purchase price that will allow me to provide them with a you know, an average IRR of 18% over whatever the holding period is. Let's just say that I, we set a holding, a 10 year holding period. If I can reach an average IRR 18% and per year for that 10 year holding period, whatever the acquisition cost, you know, the purchase price is that allows me to do that, that's the most I can pay for that property. Now, is that market value? I, you know, I, I, for my purpose, it's going to serve my purposes if I'm promising them a return of 
then for me, I, it doesn't really matter if it's market value or not. It's going to serve my purposes. But if everyone else in my situation is approaching it the same way, and they're all trying to provide their investors with an IRR of 18%, then you, I, you could make the argument that, yes, that is market value. But, uh, it's not... Well, I just wanted to offer that. You know, just to, it's approaching it, not necessarily from an appraiser's perspective, you know, a past appraiser's perspective, current investors in perspective. That's a couple of ways that you could look at a distressed asset like a hotel and come up with an estimate of the market value. Evan, could I just agree with you? I, I know other speakers haven't gone, but just give me 15 seconds. I, I We have not even talked about hotels that don't do DCS, that don't need a DCF. And Evan, I think you're absolutely right. You know, DCF is, I mean, we apply it often, but there's so many other ways to get there and buyers and sellers and even what you just described. So I, I would agree, we haven't even talked about that, but I think that's a big piece of the market, smaller, some smaller properties I would never do a DCF on, you know, and, and other ways to look at it. But anyway, I don't mean to, to take more airtime. So thank you, but I, I agree with everything you just said. Thank you very really much. I, yes, please, one, one go ahead. Comment, one quick comment. This yeah, maybe this is a joke, but I still remember a few of the things you taught me, Scott. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're too kind. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so what we can see is that uh, even you do uh, any analysis, the thing is uh, it should be explainable uh, to both the buyers and the seller, and they should be uh, reasonable enough for them to accept it. So this is what we have to work it out maybe the valuer of the buyers and the valuer of the seller may have to fight and discuss a lot on the value that should be derived. And uh, for your information in Phuket, the, uh, our most uh, uh, renowned uh, resort city, uh, there are over 100 hotels for sales. You can come and shop around. <laughs> so this is the case. And also people are selling it. And also there are some uh, successful deal as well. So this is the uh, case of uh, Phuket. And uh, Ms. Iwa says something very really interesting about the location that is a really uh, good location. You can see that uh, before the COVID-19, say in uh, 2019, 2018, any hotel that uh, uh, next to the airport, like airport hotels in the good location next to the airport or uh, historical places uh, where many backpacks like to stay there or uh, many uh, good hotels by the river. Uh, because in Thailand, we have a really big river, maybe around uh, 400 meters wide. Uh, uh, and that river will be a very great view, like Chiratan or uh, Shangri-La or uh, uh, Mandarin Oriental. They are all uh, at that uh, location. So that location cannot be changed. And also in the location with the great shopping uh, paradise in the uh, retail centers in that area, if they are uh, property for sale, the bargain price may be not low and may be quite uh, attractive for the buyers. But normally the seller won't sell it because uh, they are financially strong enough. But for those new ones that uh, they have debt to the banks, uh, they also have no income right now, maybe uh, they have a need to sell it. So this is what happened to uh, in our uh, case. So any other contribution? Uh, Mr. Elwin Fernandez, are you still there? Or maybe you take a pill and sleep? Or, or maybe, uh, uh, really, ah, Mr. Fernandez, you are here. So uh, before uh, we leave or uh, something, you may kindly contribute something. Uh, maybe you need some Red Bull or something to make you fresh. But uh, right now, I think you may kindly uh, uh, say something, uh, some reflection. Uh, go ahead, sir. Now, I... I think that, uh, you know, that model which I showed you is the model that we use for market value. But apart from market value, I would agree there's the other thing called investment value. So the investment value is done from the, from the point of view of, of an individual with a certain set criteria and so on. So one has to know both. So I remember reading an article a long time ago in, the, uh, in RICS that if you know only one, you know only half the story. 
but if you know what the market value is and you can make that you can make another assessment known as investment value and there may be a number of such investments for different investors then you are a better informed person who can make better decisions now the one i the example i gave you is about uh, a very good market uh, hotel in kuala lumpur now of course there are there are there are other hotels which are not doing as well but it all it goes down into the numbers it goes it goes down into you as a valuer looking at the numbers and adjusting it so it may be you know some of the hotels may be down by 20% 30% from last year and so on now i also agree that there will be a little bit of a shake out once the covid is over now kuala lumpur is going through high levels of vaccination and apparently we will quite reach 80 to 100% very soon of vaccinations for all the adult population and for children as well uh, is going to start again but we don't know what the other things that are going to come out again whether there's going to be a need for a, a third dose and so on so things are still in a great state of flux and we do not know what really is going to happen in the next 1 to 2 years so but as valuers what we know is is not we, we are not lost we have the ability to do our work and we have the necessary tools to adjust our models to whatever requirement there is so that we have so therefore to answer your primary question how to value that's not an issue it's not an issue at all we know how to do it we just got to have greater amount of information and that is what you do in your everyday work and you put it into your uh, models which you know is either a market value or an investment value uh, and so on and and uh, lastly i would say that you know i think uh, covid has also taught the whole world how important a valuer is thank you there is a question uh, saying that uh, when we do our dcf uh, for how long do you normally use uh, mr scott uh, bitten how long do you normally use for your dcf model we do uh, typically a 10 year unless it is a uh, a leasehold so if we don't if they don't own the land then we'll usually run it out through the end of the uh, the land lease sometimes on a rare occasion we'll do a five year but then also you know mentioned earlier you know sometimes we will look at a direct cap we don't use that frequently we we'll use it as a test of reasonableness and we also look at, uh, at a room multiplier for real small properties and don't even do a dcf so you know and again kind of go back to you know mr evan bennett's comments of how do people look at it you know and, and he's 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 one who makes the market so he's somebody who would say what do you think so what about mr evan fernandez uh, normally how long do you use in your model maybe five years or something no usually 10 years uh -huh. and then we have a terminal value but uh -huh. like mr scott said you know each uh -huh. case uh, it depends on on the requirement but usually yeah. it's 10 years. Yeah. but so, you, the principle is always this if you if you are following people like damodaran and ashwat damodaran and so on you will know that when you do a dcf sometimes you 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 at the end of the day you must reach a steady state so if you have a a property which easily reaches a steady state of 5 years then you can go for 5 years in the terminal value if it reasonably reaches a 10 years and then you have a you can go to the terminal value like for example in oil palm plantations in malaysia which is a different kind slightly different valuation as compared to Uh, hotel valuation <clears throat> you cannot reach a steady state in the market unless you you go 30 years 
Why? Because different fields in the oil palm industry go through a cycle of planting and replanting and so on. So therefore, you, the important thing to remember is you have to reach a steady state and then you can do a terminal value. Yeah. So this is what we are agree on this. And another thing that Mr. Fernandez mentioned, and also uh, many of us uh, may also uh, like to uh, uh, pay attention to this is about the uh, investment value of our investors that might be higher or uh, in, at this time maybe lower than the market price or market value. Another very important thing that we should uh, keep in mind that is the cycle, uh, as uh, Mr. Fernandez says, that is, uh, we all know that uh, when we run a hotel, uh, if there is no pandemic, in this case, there should be not much problem in the market. However, we also have a, a, a cycle or life of the uh, buildings, or cycle or life of the uh, furnishing or uh, about the uh, our country risk that will be uh, getting uh, involved as well or the management or uh, the hotel markets in general so there are so several uh, uh, life cycle that we have to consider uh, particularly if a hotel closed down for a few years or uh, at least one year uh, one problem that is the depreciation that occur maybe sometimes uh, uh, they may be the cost to kill may be pretty high so that is something that we have to uh, keep in mind uh, as well in our model in our model yeah. so this is what we uh, learn from each other on these uh, matters uh, so when we normally value the hotel uh, we also have to consider uh, what are happening where where are we in the cycle uh, so that when we do the DCF, we know that uh, what will be happening uh, in the future as well. Uh, so, any any comment from Mr. Bennett? Uh, any more contributions, sir? There was one thing I wanted to bring up, and it has been uh, mentioned sort of in the earlier presentations. But at least in the United States, we haven't really seen that many transactions taking place during the pandemic. Not that many hotels have sold or have traded hands. And I think one of the reasons why uh, that's the case is because you know, the government, the United States government has pumped so much money uh, into the economy, uh, you know, provide, providing a relief to small businesses and, and hotels and whatnot. And, and in addition to that, you know, the banks themselves, uh, they've been working with their borrowers, yeah, their commercial borrowers. So the, the hotels may have some, because they're not uh, generating much revenue, they may have some difficulty in making their uh, their loan payments. The banks are willing to work with them. If for no other reason, the banks don't want to take the hotels back. Uh, you know, if, if the hotels aren't earning any money, if they're not making a profit, why would the bank want to take it back? And it would just be a loss for the bank. Instead, they just want to write it down and work with the, the borrower and hopefully uh, things will be better once uh, we're on the other side of COVID. And, uh, you know, the, the hotel is again operating that stabilized occupancy. But I just wonder, that explains the American uh, market. That's why there aren't that many transactions taking place in the United States. But what about some of the other countries? Maybe, you know, some of the other, the panelists could comment on you know how many transactions are taking place in their countries and you know just maybe speak to that a little bit yeah so uh and uh, in, when you discuss about the uh the trend in uh the us uh another thing you can you will or maybe you remember that the uh trump towers or trump hotel in the uh uh, southern part of what where they were they uh, they blow up, blow down the the whole uh, tower. What is the name of that building? I cannot remember. Can, can you remember the uh, uh, the whole building? Uh, just uh, this year, uh, February, uh, they uh, demolished the whole buildings because uh, that is the uh, 
uh, casino and also the hotels. And it is not uh, worth enough to uh, heal. So they just uh, 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 demolish it. I cannot remember that hotel is really. I, I, I said, well, that does, bring, that does bring up a good point. So if we're talking about the value of a property, uh, if, if it's a distressed hotel and the highest and best use is no longer a hotel, it's worth whatever the, the land value is. So basically, you, you can always fall back on land value. Okay, yeah, that is. Uh, any other contribution, Mr. Ivan uh, Wilkoff? Any other contribution, sir? Just a, a couple of comments on, on the general topic. Uh, in our markets, basically, uh, what Ivan was saying, we don't have any transactions at all in the last couple of years. And that pretty much allowed certain more active and professional owners and uh, operators to focus on energy efficiency measures that in Europe nowadays is pretty much a fashion and talk of the town. They are really uh, affordable financial uh, instruments that would allow them while they are not busy with uh, customers to actually upgrade a little bit some of the uh, systems within those properties and eventually get ready for the next uh, uh, requirements that probably after the pandemic will be needed for uh, managing the five and four star uh, uh, properties in, in certain case, which inevitably will uh, need uh, uh, certain uh, adjustments in their asset values. And that would be pretty much the, the, the activities down here. What's uh, one last thing I want to, to add to that in we are witnessing uh, pretty much a, a zero activity in the investment market, but the developers are not uh, uh, shy at all. And there are quite a few uh, newly uh, started projects in, in the hotel industry, which are uh, focused on four or five years uh, 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 projects to, to, to get back to the market. Again, with the, 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 um, the facilities and amenities that would meet uh, potential higher uh, uh, requirements for the, from the medical and uh, general well-being uh, uh, requirements by the authorities. And that will be something to watch uh, in, in the next couple of years. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just remember, uh, just says, and found that it is called Trump Plaza at the Atlantic City uh, in February 17. They just blow up. Uh, so uh, as uh, Mr. Uh, Bennett said, that at least the land is there. So they were uh, going to develop something else because uh, they cannot be, uh, they cannot compete. It, uh, this building, uh, Trump Plaza, may not be able to compete with other building in that uh, Atlantic City anymore. So that is why uh, there may be no uh, economic life. Uh, the physical life may be there, but uh, they uh, should be demolished or something. So that happened. So anyone else uh, would like to have some last words, sir? Uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Eva, any more, uh, any more to say, Madam? Nothing, nothing else to say. It is very interesting to, to listen to the, the experts, Mr. Mr. Elvin uh, Fernandez and also Scott Bethan. It's an honor to have them with, with us. And I have a, a question for one of, of them or both if they want to answer about what do they think is changing an, uh, in appraisal in appraisal uh, um, discipline, as an as an appraiser, uh, what things do I have to to take uh, care to do an, a good appraisal in the future? Uh, Mr. Uh, Scott Witten, uh, and any any comments, uh, any answer? Sure. The discipline. Yeah, I, I think you know what's changing as an appraiser is data availability. And that's not across all markets and in all locations, but more and more and more broadly, specific hotel data is becoming and has become and these will become more available. And I think as, as a valuer, you know, when Mr. Fernandez said earlier, you know, the market, the market, the market, 
part of that is understanding what data is out there, how to get it, and then how to look at it. You know, STR uh, is global. And, you know, um, real capital analytics that, you know, now these are the larger, some of the larger investment, you know, grade properties, but even at the local level, understanding what data is out there and things more and more electronic and, and they're available online. Um, you know, for us, we haven't even talked about the home sharing market. So Airbnb and, you know, other, other like kind, um, you know, companies. And, and there's now a company that goes and scrapes the Airbnb data. It's called AirDNA and they do it on a daily basis. And so they get the data that, you know, that these, you know, units were all listed for. And, and then when those disappear, they presume that they get sold at those prices. So you can get reports and understand how, how much of an effect the home sharing market is. So a, a long answer to a short question, but really it's understanding what data is out there and understanding what you're appraising. You know, if you're a hotel specialist, appraise hotels. If you're not, do what you're good at or learn how, what the data is that's out there. And that's, and, and that's what I think. And I think all the folks here are hotel, you know, very hotel centric and, you know, we're all, the whole panel is a bunch of really smart people. And, and, you know, I suspect many of the participants are in the <clears> same category and they, they know the market or they're learning the market. I, I just, I think understanding the market and getting the data is what's really changing. And, and um, yeah, and Thank you. it's the same <laughs> around the globe. You know, I mean, I listened to all these presentations from everybody else on the panel. Everybody said not the same thing, but very similar things. I mean, so, you know, I, I think that there's been a lot of education. You know, RICS is a great organization. IVSC, I mean, how do we live without these before? And so I just, I just think that understanding, you know, what your peers would do and understanding the markets are really important. Thank you. Um, last week, I just heard that our ICS, a Royal, Charter, a Royal Institution of Charter Surveyor, Surveyors, where we are members, they are also in big trouble. Uh, there are some problems inside uh, their the organization as well. So that is uh, uh, bad news. And uh, as we, uh, I would like to also ask the question uh, for Miss Eva in Spain, are there many hotels for sale right now? Madam, are, are there many hotels for sale right now? No, I think the, the, the picture of the actual moment is like uh, the, the, the moment before you take the, the picture. So silent, uh, observing and uh, taking look uh, look for the alternative usings, but they are only surviving and maybe oh, expecting that the future will be better. I, but I think there, there, is, there is not a lot uh, or, not a lot. or zero or zero transactions the last, the mm. last two years as uh, Ivan has thought. What about uh, in the case of Bukalia? Mr. Ivan, in Bukalia, are there many hotels for sale right now? For people to go and shop right now? <laughs> no, actually, uh, what the owners and uh, uh, the operators are, uh, are doing, they even if there were some in the past, they withhold them from the from the active uh, uh, um, display, and th there is uh, currently no no uh, ho hotels in, in in aggressive marketing, uh, uh, if I can put it this way. Uh, there are uh, several international chains of, of hotel operators that are developing future properties, as I mentioned, and that will be interesting uh, novelty to the to the general stock. But uh, basically, the owners are deciding in those the very uh, uh, uncertain uh, market uh, times to uh, uh, to keep it as much as possible and expect uh, some upgrade in the both market conditions and the general property conditions if they are about to, to sell it. The good thing is our financial institutions and the banks are pretty uh, accommodating to that, uh, uh, to that position and not forcing them to, to do some unnecessary measures at, not, at that see. point. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Fernandez, I, in my literature, uh, they, uh, there is one uh, guy saying that in hotel, uh, industry in uh, Hong uh, in Malaysia, the uh, uh, selling price for the distressed property of hotels uh, uh, thirty five percent discount. Uh, do you agree with this uh, study from Miss uh, uh, Surana uh, Said or something? 
uh, do you agree that normally in Malaysia right now uh, it is this cow for 35 percent uh, <clears throat> what has happened in the last one year is that some hotels have closed down not many in mm. fact some one or two key ones have closed down there's been some publicity about it there have been other hotels that have closed down for renovations and upgrading no. The number of them are uh, five-star hotels and so on. Mm. The market generally has not plunged or anything like that. So I doubt that there is, uh, there may be some of the smaller hotels or whatever that may be up for sale at discounts as steep as 35%. But so far, I have not come across that kind of easy picking. I think that generally uh, the owners as well will not be willing to sell that easily. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Thank because you. it's not that bad. Mm. And uh, I, they, they, I'm not a hotel valuer. I'm a valuer. So I do all kinds of properties. Thank if I do that. hotel valuations in a small country like Malaysia, I'll be out of business very soon. <laughs> Thank you. But so, in Thailand, so, we have uh, many. One last, oh, one last have word. You ahead? Ah, yes. One last word. You know, um, I think things will change. But what really needs to change is the valuers themselves. <laughs> valuers must upgrade their skills, number one, and make themselves more competent and they must have more integrity. If you have competence and you have no integrity, you are not a valuer. If you have integrity, but no competence, you're not a valuer as well. Two most important things as we go forward for valuers is that you must have competence and integrity. Yeah. I see. Thank you, Dr. sir. Yeah. Could, could, could I just add to the yes, question please. you just asked? Please. And forgive me. A blanket statement of a 35% or X percent in a country for me is hard. And I'll tell you why I say that, because, you know, in the U.S., we do have transactions and I'll compare and contrast. You mentioned a hotel that the best thing to do was to to just to, to bring it all the way down to the ground. I've got mm -hmm. a friend who sells hotels. They had a, a five property portfolio and they put it out in the market. And he said, they took it off the market and they got so many offers and one buyer came in and said, look, don't even finish the marketing process. We'll pay you almost anything you want. And these were, you know, more extended stay properties. But, you know, so one hotel, the best thing to do is to demolish it. Five hotels, the market went nuts for them. And this is right now, you know, so I just kind of say things are so different in every country, I think would be the same thing. So I've just, you know, it just always, always fascinates me about the, the variance in any property type and the particular hotels right now, because what a disrupted industry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. maybe, yeah, thank you. Maybe we come to an end. Uh, I would like to just mention that uh, in the case of Thailand, uh, we have around over 40 million uh, tourists from abroad to come to Thailand. That is why uh, we have so many hotels and uh, because of that, uh, we have so many hotels uh, for sale right now, but uh, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of hotels, but uh, uh, maybe we have so many uh, hotels for sale as well. So that is a problem. But in the case of uh, international, uh, internationally branded hotels, uh, so far as I see, there is no uh, problem, except uh, some of them may have to close down right at, like this, at this moment because of the uh, pandemic. We uh, do not allow our visitors to come to Thailand. And in this case, uh, there is no uh, international tourist, but maybe in the future it can be like in uh, uh, Maldives, they have a lot of international uh, tourists, even in the uh, pandemic. So in this case, uh, the hotel industry are still going on well. The, uh, there may be only one third of the tourists uh, come, but so uh, that uh, men are a large amount already. But in Thailand, 40 million become only less than uh, uh, 8 or 10 million only. So in that case, a big uh, discount. And another thing, 
uh, that we have to uh, consider is that the approaches that we work for valuation sometimes we also have to uh, think of something of the paradigm shift as well we are not just calculating something and in this case uh, our valuers also uh, have to think as an uh, investor have to think as uh, uh, the one that who really have to pay for uh, the investment and have to uh, foresee what will be happen in this industry otherwise uh, our uh, valuation may be uh, misleading in the future. So that is uh, uh, what we have to say. So our speakers kindly share your uh, PowerPoint or your uh, uh, files uh, to uh, me or maybe to the VFC headquarters so that we can distribute to our uh, interested person uh, so that we can uh, be benefit from this session. And hopefully, this video may be taken and then we can disseminate in the future as well. So uh, let me thanks all the speakers and all our participants here. Still 71 people here. Uh, we have legislation for 230, 40, but we have 71 here, still here. So these 71 may be a good future of values uh, so that uh, they will uh, perform well in the future. So thank you very much and see you later. Take care. Uh, all the best to you. Uh, good morning and good night to you.